mentioned before, I think that topics tend to be local, but for the fifth and final talk of this session, I'm very happy to introduce Tim Palmer, um, because we have a topic by a local, so we invented invariant set theory. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to talk. Um, so, uh, I want to talk about um, a possible resolution of the Bell theorem in favour of realism and local causality. Um, but I should say, just before I start, that I'm, my background is very much in uh, general relativity theory. That's where I did my DPhil here in Oxford many years ago. And um, the real motivation for this work is actually much more the sort of things that Lucien uh, talked about yesterday, um, how to bring together uh, general relativity and, and quantum physics. And um, as such, I would certainly endorse his, uh, I don't know if it was meant seriously or flippantly, but let me endorse it anyway, if there was a move to generalize QPL in future years, uh, I do feel that the uh, resolution of the problem of unification in physics does require some clarification about foundations of quantum theory. So uh, QPL had a component in that direction, I would certainly be um, supporting it. Um, so, um, to explain um, the violation, experimental violation of Bell inequalities, as we all know, we have to violate either realism, local causality, or this notion of me measurement independence, that um, probability distributions over some putative uh, hidden variable uh, model or hidden variable are independent of the measurement settings um, A and B. Now, if one uh, therefore requires or wishes a model that is realistic and locally causal, one is forced to consider um, violations of that third uh, condition, measurement independence. However, I think almost universally in the literature, these are such models are considered to be implausible uh, from a physical perspective, and uh, for various probably related reasons, um, that models have to be very fine-tuned, uh, conspiratorial, is something that Bell himself was concerned about. Uh, maybe there's some denial of experimental free will somehow, or maybe the only way to rescue them is through some retro-causal physics, which also most people find uncomfortable with. I'm going to try and claim that the answer actually is, is no. There is a way to, um, to overcome these uh, objections. Now, if I'm going to make a statement like that, I guess there has to be some kind of meat uh, in the, to the substance. And uh, the meat, ah, I now immediately see, uh, unfortunately, the computer hasn't translated the symbols very well here. Oh dear, that's a shame. Right, so the meat uh, is in two parts. One is um, mathematical and one is, um, is uh, physical. And I want to come to the, the mathematical part first. Um, so the notion of fine-tunedness uh, is the idea that uh, theory uh, should be uh, robust to small perturbations. However, that already uh, raises the question about what do we mean by small? What do we mean by the word small? And um, this is unfortunately where the thing has gone wrong. Um, so in, in mathematics, um, if we have the, the field, this should have been the field of uh, rational numbers, um, there are two ways to complete uh, the rational numbers. Um, and to, to complete the rational numbers, we see we need some measure of a norm or an amplitude. Um, so one is the, is the familiar Euclidean norm, which takes us to real numbers. Um, but the second, in equivalent norm, in fact there are only these two are the two only in equivalent norms, um, take us to a, a field called the Piadic uh, numbers. Now, I'm not going, unless people want to know, I'm not going to define this uh, Piadic norm, I can do so at the end if people want to know, but um, I think the, the crucial uh, point, well for me, for my understanding of these things, is that Euclidean norms are very um, are the things you want to use when you're discussing properties of Euclidean geometry, which are the things that we learn about in school and so on. 
But p-adic norms turn out to be the um, the the the, um, the set the uh, sorry, I can't think of what I want to use now the sensible way um, to uh, talk about fractal geometry. Um, and I'll, I'll come on to this in a minute. Now, number theorists use both of these norms almost equally in their work. I'm sure people are familiar with the idea that Andrew Wiles's proof of Fermat's last theorem made essential use of the p-adic norms to define solutions over Diophantine equations. I believe physicists should also um, start thinking about the application of these norms too. Um, I put look up at the sky because just look up on a day when there are cumulus clouds and you'll see fractal structures in the clouds. Or if there aren't cumulus clouds in the sky, look at uh, Google Maps and zoom into a coastline and again you'll see fractal structures. Piadic norms are very natural uh, measures of amplitude with which to study those types of geometries. So what I want to do in this talk is describe a, a, a model, um, a hidden variable ontic model for quantum physics which is locally causal, which is realistic but for which the natural measure of amplitude is this, not uh, the Euclidean measure. And my claim is that theory is not fine-tuned with respect to that norm, and hence it's neither, is, neither is, is it conspiratorial or deny free will. Okay, uh, again, I wish I'd checked these slides before I gave this talk, because it's, it's translated almost everything here. Um, so this is a mapping, this is essentially a homeomorphism between what are called the uh, dyadic or two-adic integers and, um, and points of the Cantor uh, ternary set, which is one of the most uh, basic of uh, fractal um, of sets. Um, so if this is the fractal set, this is, uh, this is an intersection of iterates, so you take all these iterates and take their intersection, and this is homeomorphic to the dyadic integers which is a subset, okay. Oh, great. There you go. Which is a subset. The dyadic integers are a subset of the, <laughs> okay, of the um, of the dyadic numbers, which were the completion. Uh, so, so what are called um, Z P are subsets of Q P, and it's these uh, Z P's which are. Um, sort of algebraic descriptions of fractal geometric sets. So the simplest one is the, is the simple Cantor ternary set where you just throw away middle thirds forever and take the intersection. Um, this would be the five adic numbers which are homeomorphic to this uh, um, more sort of slightly more general type of Cantor set based on number five. But the, this, um, the, the, the mapping between these uh, uh, p-adic integers and, and fractals uh, generalizes for arbitrary p, um, let's call prime, usually we work with prime numbers p. And the key point I want to uh, draw to your attention is that if you take two points on this uh, fractal set which are close together with respect to the norm or the, amp the metric on the Euclidean space in which the, in which the fractal is embedded, so two points which are close together with respect to the Euclidean norm, and they both lie on the fractal set, then their p-adic norm will also, uh, their p-adic distance will also be small. However, if you take two points, one of which is on the uh, fractal set, but the other is not, even though these points may be close together with respect to the Euclidean norm, their p-adic uh, distance will be at least equal to p. Now if p is a big, if p, the prime p is a big prime, then these points will be far apart, this is a crucial point, they'll be far apart uh, in the p-adic metric even though they look uh, close together in the Euclidean metric. Um, fractals are commonplace in nonlinear dynamical systems, this is the famous uh, Lorentz attractor, the attractor itself is defined by techniques um, in, in global analysis, which I'll leave out for now, but there is a point about this which I'll come to at the end of the talk. But the key issue is that locally, we took a sort of local region of the, uh, say, Lorentz attractor. It's locally the Cartesian product of the real line, which gives us these trajectories, integral curves of the differential equations. 
across some transverse structure which is itself a, a form of Cantor set. All right, so that's the, if you like, mathematical meat. The physical meat is something which, um, just view it as a postulate, you can take it or leave it if you like, but the postulate is that the universe itself is to be considered a dynamical system uh, evolving precisely on some kind of uh, fractal, uh, measure zero fractal subset in the state space of the universe. Now, you know, if I had another half an hour we could talk about whether cosmological observations are consistent with this postulate or not, uh, but we don't have that time so just treat it as, as a postulate, a physical postulate upon which um, I want to base the, the subsequent theory. So one key idea, just to uh, fix, fix ideas, is that this uh, notion um, embodies the idea that the most primitive e expressions of the laws of physics should not really be thought of those differential equations which map um, points in state space to other points in state space, which in a way is the way in which physics has been formulated uh, in the past, but rather um, to think about the expressions of the laws of physics as descriptions of this, uh, ge of this geometry in, in, in state space. And in particular, I'm going to consider a model for this geometry which is actually based precisely on these piadic uh, integers, properties of these piadic integers. Um, I, I'm attracted to this because like uh, general relativity, this makes this theory very geometric at heart, but it has some interesting features which general relativity does not have, um, which is that it has many very direct links to number theory, precisely through this, um, this homomorphism. Um, this is something I've written a few papers on, so I'm just going to refer uh, to some references uh, if you're interested in detail, you can come back and or look at the paper or something that in the public in the proceedings. Okay, so um, I want to try and sort of in quick quickly, if you like, but this is a bit difficult to condense a lot of this into a short talk. Just give you a flavour for what's going on here, and just to fix ideas, consider something like um, a Stern-Gerlach experiment or a sequential Stern-Gerlach experiment where particles are being fired into a magnetic field and being split um, and maybe the upper beam is fired into a second one this could in principle carry on indefinitely and this is supposed to be a picture of that process uh, in state space if you like where we have, uh, let's say at one level of the fractal, one sort of iterate of the fractal we have something that look, looks a bit Everettian in the sense we have a trajectory which, uh, which undergoes some sort of splitting, um, but on magnifying to the next level of um, the uh, iterate, we find that actually it's not Everettian at all, it's not splitting, because there are, uh, uh, at the next level of iterate, there are um, uh, sort of these helical structures, um, some of which, as they untangle with this instability, go in this direction, and others in this direction. These helices actually are manifestations of a quaternionic structure in, the, in this invariant set geometry, which are a direct result, again, of the piadic integers. Now, one property of the piadic integers is that they contain within them representation of the complex um, p, p, well, p minus one roots of unity. And that leads to all sorts of interesting uh, mathematics to do with Pontryagin in duality and so on, but I won't go into that now. Um, but anyway, so the, the, this, the fact that these things have embedded in them representations, essentially of complex numbers, means that there's a geometric representation of that, um, and these obviously can be linked to things like Dirac matrices and so on, if one wants to take it further. And then the point is, you come to the second stone girl like it's a device, and the same thing happens again, because this really is a fractal structure, self-similar structure, at, uh, at multiple levels in the state space. So again, you see the same thing. 
Now, there's an interesting um, linkage to the Hilbert, complex Hilbert space of quantum mechanics by looking at, the, looking at these individual trajectories and representing them as bit strings where a bit is either a red bit or a blue bit, if you like. And an element of, of complex Hilbert space for a qubit is, is, is somehow linked to one of these bit strings. But the crucial point is that this uh, is, not a, is not a bijection, it's an injection, which means there are many, many, many elements of, of the complex Hilbert space that have no correspondence with these, um, with these structures. And in particular, and this is a crucial point, the only elements of complex Hilbert space that have a correspondence with these structures are those where cosine of theta is a, uh, is a, a rational number which can be described by a finite n number of bits, and where phi, the phase angle, is also, as a, as a multiple of pi, or as a fraction of pi, represented by uh, a, a rational number with a finite number n of bits. And n is related to the p of the p-addicts by this formula here. So p is like a Fermat prime, if you like, where n is some, a large Fermat prime. Okay, now I just need to do a quick uh, interlude, five minutes, okay, which says, which is kind of the heart of this, um, this has got nothing to do with physics, but if you take a triangle with three points um, on the sphere, uh, the, that triangle uh, satisfies the cosine rule, that sort of elementary spherical geometry. But let's say we have two sides of this triangle where the cosine of theta is describable by n bits, so let's suppose that side has a cosine which is describable by n bits, and that side has a cosine which is describable by n bits, and let's say this angle as a multiple of pi is describable by n bits, then the cosine rule tells you that this uh, side as a cosine can't be describable by n bits. Now that property uh, I've is, is relevant to pretty much all of the quantum phenomena I've uh, looked at in this approach because uh, I've got now four minutes I'll only talk about the Bell theorem uh, again I'll even do this rather quickly um, so this is the original Bell inequality um, and it basically and it's based on these three points A, B and C um, in the theory uh, the correlations are given by cosines, exactly as in quantum uh, theory. However, by the triangle rule, this one that I've just elucidated, if these, point, if these values here have these rational cosines, then this one here um, uh, cannot be, just by geometry, just by geometry and number theory, can't belong to um, this set of rational cosines. So that means... As this is written precisely, the Bell inequalities are undefined on the invariant set, on this invariant set, and therefore, according to the theory, not experimentally verifiable. So then the question is, well, what, does, what do experimenters do when they actually do do experiments to, um, to show that the Bell inequalities are violated? And the point is, when they do experiments, they do experiments on subsets of particles um, uh, separately for each to determine each of these correlations. So, um, invariant set theory says that um, uh, what's actually measured are correlations between, let's say, A and C, B and C, but not between A and B, but between A and some B prime, where the angle between A and B prime and A and B prime are almost but not quite equal. So, the difference between A and B, A, B prime and the angular distance between AB prime and AB is smaller than some finite precision of any experimental apparatus. Now that seems like fine tuning. That seems kind of you might your reaction to that might be that's very that's very fine tuned and therefore not a good model of, for physics. But in a way, this is the key point that um, a universe where the um, the Alice and Bob measure where their relative angle is AB prime, which is a rational angle, lies on the invariant set. And one where AB prime is not a rational angle, 
by definition, doesn't lie on the invariant set. And even though this Euclidean distance might be small, the p-adic distance, from what I just said earlier, is very large. So the perturbation, if you like, that led you to think about the counterfactual experiment AB is very, very, very far away from the physical um, experiment. Now, if you look at the whole literature about, count, uh, about conspiracy, it's all based on counterfactual perturbations, which seem to be very small and insignificant. And they are in this Euclidean sense, but in what I'm claiming to be the more physically based norm for this theory, they're actually very, very large. All right, so uh, my theory violates measurement independence, but it's not fine-tuned or conspiratorial because it's quite robust to this p-adic noise, noise which keeps you on this fractal invariant set. It doesn't violate anything to do with free will because the allowed angles, the rational angles, are as dense as you like for large enough uh, p. And there's some issues to do with non-computability, which I won't uh, talk about. Have I still got one minute? Mm, yes. Not really. Okay, I did have a cock up at the beginning, so... So, I just wanted to say that quantum theory kind of fits in in a kind of neat way here. Um, if you take one of these uh, fractal sets and let P get bigger and bigger, then the Hausdorff dimension of the set tends to 1. So it looks like it's tending to uh, the, real, the real interval, the interval, would say, between 0 and 1. However, for any, for any finite P, the measure of that fractal set is strictly 0, no matter how big P is. So actually the real numbers are a kind of singular limit. They're not as smooth limits of P addicts as P goes to infinity. There's a, they're a singular limit. And that, you know, that's discussed a bit in some of the maths books. And similarly, the, the Hilbert space as a closed algebraic space is also a singular limit of my theory uh, as P goes to infinity. Now, Michael Berry, the physicist at Bristol, has made a big thing about uh, singular limits being kind of a, 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 an important part of how physics develops. Old theories are generally the singular limits, and not the smooth limits, of new theories. Geometric optics is the singular limit of Maxwell's equations. Um, thermodynamics is the singular limit of statistical mechanics. Classical mechanics is the singular limit of quantum theory. Newtonian physics is the singular limit of general relativity. Another example is Euler theory is the singular limit of Navier-Stokes theory um, for, um, for fluids uh, as the Reynolds number goes to infinity or the viscosity goes to zero. But it's important to, to recognize that this is a singular and not a smooth limit because if you take the example of Euler theory, you can do lots of very good things with uh, strictly inviscid flow, uh, simulating turbulence and so on. But sometimes that singular limit theory completely and utterly breaks down. So Euler theory, for example, would predict that aeroplanes would never fly. Uh, so that's where the, the limit, the singular limit, gives you a radically different um, uh, sort of set of observations. My own view is that quantum theory may similarly be of a similar character. It may work very well most of the time in the laboratory, but it may fail catastrophically, like Euler theory does in, in, for inviscid fluid dynamics. Um, but perhaps where gravity is important, so that comes back to my beginning of the point about, uh, about thinking about these foundational issues in the context of uh, general relativity. So uh, my view is experimental violation Bellingquart does not yet totally close the door on uh, a locally causal ontic theory of quantum physics. And just to say, um, I've left a few flyers out of a, uh, an issue of uh, for philosophical transactions out in the coffee room, which Andreas Döring and I, I think Andreas is probably known to people here in this department, uh, had at, uh, at a place called Chichley Hall last year. So uh, Lucian, for example, has got a paper in that, Roger Penrose and others. Um, that's it, thank you. Um, uh, and um, well, 
Do I have a minute or not? I mean, I could. I, could. I mean, the basic idea is that um, if you imagine a, um, an, inter, um, an interferometer, um, uh, so let's call this A, I don't know, A, B, C, D, E, or something. Um, yeah, and we're going to put a, a phase shift phi in. So um, in standard quantum theory, um, uh, let's say C plus uh, E to the, to the you have a, um, if you do a unitary transformation uh, on the in input uh, state, it goes to some superposed state with this phase factor introduced by a phase shift to phi, and then you recombine the beams, and you get something like cosine phi over 2 times E state E plus sine phi over 2 um, times uh, D. Um, so that, that's the sort of standard unitary evolution. Now, this, this is exactly the same um, number theory, if you like, uh, applies. That if, if you do the measurement here, it implies that cosine phi has a finite bit representation. But if cosine phi has a finite bit representation, then phi doesn't. And so this state, which is what you would be measuring if you sort of interrupted the beam and put measuring apparatuses here to find out which way the particle is going through, um, doesn't lie on the invariant set. So you have a natural, so basically number theory, what the idea is in this approach, number theory gives you a, a sort of rational explanation for why it's not possible uh, to determine um, which, which way the particle is going through the, through the interferometer. So it provides, a, if you like, an alternative, again, what I see as a more realistic approach to, to wave particle duality. But read it up, get more detail. But it's the same triangle rule. It's the fact that, um, yeah, it's just that same triangle rule. Quick question. Uh, so in, in field theories, you can define sort of causality sort of using the real structure. That's a sort of those are, those are, those are fine using continuous numbers. Do you have a corresponding definition of causality in, in, in this kind of structure? Or sort of well, I might get into trouble because it's not a. No, I mean, I, I, um, I'm assuming that the basic notion of causality and local causality as, you know, as Bell, <coughs> Bell himself sort of defined, which is to say the value of some uh, field at a, at a point in space-time is determined entirely by data on the past light cone, is uh, Holt. So this theory would not wish to tamper or violate the all. classical space-time. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know yet exactly what, I don't quite sure at the moment what structure this is telling me about space-time, if I'm honest about it, that's something I don't yet know. But what I'm saying is there's no reason to suppose that the causality condition in this theory is anything other than you would get from a, from a, a simple classical causal um, picture of space-time. So I'm not tampering with, see, that's the point, this, I'm keeping the notion of causality exactly as, you know, as Bell and others would wish it to be, which is basically that past data on the light, on the past light cone determines the future. You don't need to know information about something space-like separated. Okay, you can earn your coffee by thanking Tim and all the speakers.